shortly before the shortage era. I was just looking at the uh, class number issue and pathway, and I just wanted to finish off that topic uh, by looking briefly at the explanatory note. I don't think I need to take you to anything other than my skeleton on that. Um, the, uh, as a starting point from what it is, uh, if you look at tab nine of the core bundle, page, uh, sorry, paragraph 77, 109 bundle, uh, the lease classification explanatory note to class 38 is informative. It makes clear that class 38 is intended to apply to communications between person things or things. Class 38 includes mainly services allowing at least one person to communicate with another by a sensory means. Such services include those which allow one person to talk to one another, transmit messages, place a person in oral or visual communication with each other, radio, television. I think these have varied over times. This is the we say this is materially the same in each edition. You have the um, uh, the, the uh, versions in the bundles. Um, again, we don't place too much weight on this, other than it gives some idea of the sorts of bedfellows that you find in that in that, uh, that these services would find in that class. Although it's not determined by that, and probably doesn't need it. Um, but this obviously was a point that the judge left out of the count. He didn't, because uh, we know from other cases, and it's difficult to know quite how much to make of it, but his view expressed in other cases was that all of this class stuff is, is positively um, irrelevant. And I wanted to just show you the use to which that has been put in the uh, Burlington, the Tulalian case, Tulialan case, um, at paragraph 79 of my uh, skeleton. And if you look at um, that can be found I think it's tab 36 I'm very grateful my lord 36 uh, uh, in Burlington and the issue was uh, the construction of retail uh, of retail services the concept of retail services uh, and the only point that we rely on there is the are the paragraphs 125 to 127. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they're not deciding as a matter of principle that this is some sort of tiebreaker, and this tends to be the way that it's referred to in... You just tell me what page. Uh, page 481. Thank you. Uh, 127. Uh, accordingly, the concept of... Hold on, sorry, 126. It follows from <coughs> that explanatory note. So actually, pick it up, 125 must be pointed out the explanatory note related to class 35 within the meaning of the Nice Agreement states that, that class includes the bringing together for the benefit of others of a variety of goods and services, etc. These services may be provided by retail stores, wholesale outlets, vending machines, mail order, and electronic media, for example, websites. They say it follows from that explanatory note. The concept of retail services relates to three essential characteristics, namely first, the purpose of those services is the sale of goods to consumers. Secondly, they're addressed to the consumer with a view to enabling him to conveniently view or purchase. And thirdly, they're provided for the benefit of others. And accordingly, the concept of retail services covers services which are aimed at the consumer and which consist of, uh, and they define what they define. So um, they say it follows from the foregoing considerations that as the general court itself correctly held, the Court of Justice's interpretation in Para 34 of Practica, I won't get drilled down into those details, but uh, are by definition excluded from the concept of retail services in the meaning, or within the meaning of the Nice Agreement. So, I mean, that is, uh, again, I mentioned this judgment that uh, of Mr. Justice Floyd, as he then was, in the Galileo case. Do we have copies of that? Mm -hmm. I fear this is by loaded red overnight, only because it was said that, uh, uh, that the... Uh, <coughs> Point about computer software and Mercury Interactive was not widely followed. Or, well, uh, if I've misinterpreted it, uh, but actually the same point comes in here. Perhaps because my lords have not had a chance to look at it, I'll pick it up from the head note.
Galileo, the registered proprietor of three UK trademarks for Galileo. Uh, they were registered for various goods and services in class 9 and 42, computer hardware and software. Uh, and the dispute was the subject of Europe-wide litigation because of the Galileo satellite navigation system of the EU. Uh, and then, so they were, the EU sought to revoke the Galileo mark uh, and uh, Galileo's marks which were for computer hardware essentially and software were uh, had been revoked by the hearing officer partially revoked down to uh, travel reservation software so a purposive uh, functional consideration um, and it was a, an appeal to the high court from the registry uh, and you can see from the Holdings in the head note. Um, there are a number of points about procedural fairness which we don't need to look at. Um, there was a point about who takes the, who has to accuse who in relation to a partially revoked software, uh, a partially revoked uh, specification. But on 433 over the page is the a passage when construing the use of computer software, which was a very wide category task of the court was to limit the specification so that it reflected the circumstances of the particular trade and the way the public would perceive the use. Um, that is uh, a, um, a real world finding and I'm asked to um, bring it as an, yet a further example. I think there's the uh, point that I raised earlier about the, the example uh, of um, ancillary goods not falling within terms of a specification. Um, if I could just show you page 441 for your note, there's the uh, unrestricted computer software specifications of enormously wide scope. The hearing officer wisely reminded himself of what Laddie J said about wide specifications. Uh, there's a strong argument that the registration of computer software is normally too wide, and so on. Uh, I <laughs> challenged those findings, uh, and I said that we should have been able to keep some other kinds of software because of the functionality within specific good, um, parts of the software and uh, uh, the court disagreed really on the basis that uh, is set out it's true that in a technical sense one could say that Galileo is selling software for calendars and document management the hearing officer was entitled to come to the conclusion this is not how the average consumer would have perceived the use he was plainly entitled to come to the conclusion that this description reflects the circumstances of the particular trade and the, pub, and, and the way the public would perceive the use. And this is this example. The average consumer does not see the sale of a car as the sale of a climate control system or computers or satellite navigation system, although cars are now often sold with such built-in functionality. These are plainly questions uh, and uh, that come up in, in other cases. Uh, and I don't think there's much more that I want to. I, I, I did send that to my learned friends overnight, so I thought I would uh, probably ought to address it. Um, can you the, explain to me what Venezuelan raisin uh, is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think come from an example given by, I think it might have been Franco White, or some uh, 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 well, well known uh, barrister in intellectual property circles uh, a few years ago. Um, what happens when you partially revoke a mark? You've got to come up with an appropriate level of generality that they can keep in the light of the use that they've shown. And uh, I think the idea is that they should be able to keep a reasonable category of goods that describes fairly the use that's been made and that you don't get too pernickety. And so for example, if someone has sold, if the registration was, and they happen to have sold a certain kind of three hole razor from Venezuela, that's not what they keep. They keep, you know, razor blades or something at a slightly, slightly higher level of generality. And the, the, the relevance of that, actually that point in this case is that in a revocation case, you get less than what the judge gave here because you only ever get what you've shown. You would never be able to get electric razors because you might expand into that in the future. Whereas in a bad faith case, you would potentially be able to do that because you had a good faith uh, intention to expand into that area. Um, and that's why we said, and I'll come to it in a moment, I'll extend it a little bit, there was never any basis for giving Sky anything more than they'd shown they'd used because they'd never put in any evidence wider than that, or that they even asked the judge to take that into account. They, was, they were all or nothing on the uh, specification. 
But anyway, I think that's um, jumping around a bit. Can I move? I think that's probably infringement. I wanted to let the court know what our position was in response to the 10-3 uh, point. My lord asked me uh, before lunch, and I said I'd take instructions. Um, on 10-3, our basic position is Sky's reputation doesn't extend beyond the core goods and services, uh, as the judge found. Therefore, there's no relevant link, we would say, in respect of the different goods and services. And in any case, even if there were a relevant link, Sky has failed out to make any failed to make out any relevant head of damage. Uh, on the order for disposal, which I think was the specific question, uh, uh, our primary position is that there's no basis on which that could become relevant for the above reasons. There's no plausible, we say, likelihood of success in relation to that. But our secondary position is if nevertheless the court contemplates an order for consideration of Section 10.3, uh, like it considers it's plainly better that it be dealt with on an inquiry or account rather than at a retrial. I hope that uh, clarifies our position. So just to uh, conclude with a, a few bundle references and important passages in evidence on bad faith. Um, on the dishonesty test, we say uh, it's quite clear that the in the context of uh, trademarks, that it isn't dishonesty in the general sense. It's uh, a modified form or a sui generis form of dishonesty, if it is even to be called dishonesty. Um, it's not a lack of intention to use test. And we have uh, the most important paragraph, paragraph 77. So if I could just ask you to take the ECJ judgment. Uh, Find that pine tab D, of course, and that is uh, just pick it up at paragraph 74. Where the court notes that the concept of bad faith presupposes the presence of a dishonest state of mind or intention. So, in accordance with its usual meaning, the concept of bad faith presupposes the presence of a dishonest state of mind or intention. Regard must be had for the purposes of interpreting that concept to the specific context of trademark law, which is that of the course of trade. And that, we say, is a very important modifier, because it's not a general, we know it's not a subjective test, and we know it's not a sort of general dishonesty test. It's in a particular context. It's in the course of trade. Uh, and they go on to note that the EU rules on trademarks are aimed in particular at contributing to the system of undistorted competition in the EU. Undertaking must, in order to attract and retain customers by the quality of its goods or services, be able to have registered uh, uh, trademarks, signs which enable the consumer, without any possibility of confusion, to distinguish those goods or services from others which have a different origin. And this comes to my learned friend's blind spot, that uh, trademarks are by title by registration. Not so. They have to have some grip on reality. There has to be some commercial rationale for them. Even the company formation uh, agent, uh, by who, by the way, can get into trouble very easily if he goes and registers other people's marks. Um, there has to be some connection with the use in the trade. It is not about populating the register to um, get a reserved sign for every uh, uh, nook and cranny of every class. They quote the Cotton uh, judgment there, and that's because the earlier judgment said exactly the same thing. Now, the ultimate test is in 75. It's not a lack of intention to use test. It's where it's apparent from relevant and consistent indicia that the proprietor of the mark has filed the application not with the aim of fair competition, but with the intention of undermining in a manner inconsistent with honest practices, either, and there seem to be two limbs, the interests of third parties, limb A, or B, with the intention of obtaining, without targeting a specific third party, an exclusive right for the purposes other than those falling within the functions of the trademark, in particular, the essential function of indicating origin. So once you become detached from that purpose, you're potentially in trouble. They're not going to define all the ways 
that bad faith can take place because these cases are all different from one another to the point I'll show you in a moment on the monopoly case. They can't possibly come up with a specific test about the length of the mark or the particular kinds of terms used or the particular behaviour because all of these cases are different. But what they do share is the purposes other than the essential function of indicating origin. And once you take your eye off that, there's a, a grave danger, we say, of uh, getting into trouble on bad faith in, 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 the, in the way... Those words are somewhat inflammatory, I expect, I accept, but they do have a particular meaning in this uh, field of law. I mean, they're not obviously saying that that's the only function. No. No, they're not. They're saying... Uh, it applies where there are those features. That's correct also, Lord, that must be right. Now, then he goes on, uh, sorry, he goes on, they go on to say, the court goes on to say, that one's not required to indicate or know precisely. So they may, what they're saying is there may be an innocent explanation to the application. Um, and 77 is the key part where they quote the Advocate General, as the Advocate General observed, the registration of a mark without an intention to use it may constitute bad, bad faith where there is no rationale, and such bad faith may only be established if there is objective, relevant, and consistent indicia showing that when the application for the mark was filed, the applicant had the intention, and then we've got the two limbs, either undermining the interests of third parties or obtaining the right for a, a purpose, a sort of an ulterior purpose. So intention is answered in that context. You'll note that they take questions three and four together, even though question three was the intention to use uh, uh, question. Does the um, extent of the reputation of the trademark owner come into this? I mean, suppose I'm a very well-known mark. I yeah. won't take Sky, but... Rolls Royce, yeah. um, and it's my genuinely held view that if you apply Rolls Royce to a huge range of goods, yeah. um, people are going to think that that's somehow associated with me. Yeah, Rolls Royce. Uh, I I can't predict. Examples uh, are so dangerous in trademarks, aren't they? Because all well, you may change one little variable, like mm. the distinctiveness of the name and the uniqueness of the name, yeah. and it makes all the difference. Sky, no. I mean, there are the evidence was there were thousands of Sky companies, thousands of Sky registers, and, and so on. But hold, hold on one minute. The ten three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and, and the second point, as I'm reminded, mm -hmm. is that uh, of course, if you are very well known. With a very high You've got, you've got mark. ten three. I fully understand. You've got ten three, and you've got it on your but Google bad, goods. Is it bad faith? So I know I've got ten three, and yeah. I can. And uh, when it comes to it, I can prove all the nine, or I've forgotten how many it is now. Things you have to prove for ten three, um, and a link, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but is it bad faith to say, well, I honestly believe that people will associate those goods with me because of the yeah. use of that mark. Yeah. And so I am bona fide saying that this is going to be in accordance with the functions of a trademark if I register this, yeah. because uh, everything that is sold of that kind will, I believe, somehow or other be associated with me. By, it has to be a trademark use by you, not by others. It can't be simply a prevention of use. Um, Why second, not? Well, well because that's not... It's not all about preventing others well, yes, but it's from not using it if it's, if it's likely to be associated um, with you. Because we would say... There, that, to show that when the application for the mark is filed, they had uh, an intention of obtaining an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling within the functions of the mark. The function of the mark is, in this case, let's just keep it simple, to indicate origin. Obviously, it doesn't indicate the origin of the little pirate or the owner of the Rolls-Royce Cafe. It doesn't. But you, should, you don't accept that it does. You're protecting your own origin function, and you protect that through the various goods and services that you have and parasitic uh, behaviour you can protect under 10.3. We would say that, first of all, that's not what happened in this case. It's quite clear that there were two parts to Sky's... What's the, what's the answer to the, to the question of principle? Why, is it, why, could, why would it be bad faith for somebody who, who genuinely believed yeah. 
that applying the mark to the whole category of goods is likely to be associated with him? Well, it's not. The fact that an applicant sees nothing wrong with his own behaviour is not sufficient. Why does it undermine the functioning of the, tr the trademark system? It functions because when you have a... If you think about it, I mean, I'll show you the Hasbro case in a moment, because that's pretty much what they argue. We are monopoly. Monopoly means us. We should be able to reapply every five years without showing any use, without abandoning our earlier marks, because it helps us against, we genuinely think it helps us against counterfeiters, against little copyists and so on, and we should be able to do that. Not so, so far by the general court. That's bad faith. Mm. It, 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 this in a way is the key point. It's not about dishonesty, and it's not about subjective dishonesty. It's about are you using it? You planning to use that mark for those goods? I mean, Sky are even, not even in that position because they didn't even approach it on the basis of of the binary question of whether it would be used or not used is simply populated the register. I mean, that, that's the evidence I'll show you, I hope, in a moment. They, they weren't that, that in that case, but I mean, all cases turn on their own facts. I don't know what the position would be with Rolls-Royce, but in general, the fact that an applicant sees nothing wrong with his own behaviour is not a defence. And what? they have protection for their mark for their core goods anyway. Whatever test you apply, whether it's the applicant's own view of his conduct or... Yeah. or, or <clears throat> the view of commercial men and women who who uh, yeah. are looking at it. Why is it why is it wrong to uh, in any in any sense yeah. to apply for a mark when you genuinely believe that the application of the mark to those goods yes. indicates you? Yes, I think I would have to accept that if you have a conditional intention in the future, let's say, that you might trade in those goods and you have turned your mind to those to those issues, there might come a point where you have been, and depending on what you apply for and all these circumstances, it might be in good faith. Well, that, that That's is, not our case. to create a precondition of intention to you. Not necessarily, because you have to have, it must be, it must be attached to your potential use, because when you apply for a trademark, that, that is the key point. I mean, that, in my submission, is what it is about. You aren't permitted to register to... Tra I don't want to use the old act language. To traffic in marks simply by virtue of the negative right that they accord. Otherwise, you just become a trademark filing operative and you apply for everything and sell the marks without any... There are actually individuals in cases like that. But uh, the, the, the message here is that it's got to be consistent with the essential function of indicating the proprietor in trade, in reality. Uh, I mean, well, I think one, that's... Of the, one of the functions of the mark expre expressly uh, recognised in 10.3 is stopping yes. uh, people trading on your reputation. Absolutely. My Lord. And that... So why, why are you undermining that by saying, no. well, I want, I want these um, goods because application of the mark to those goods. But well, you're, um, I'll trade what you're on my reputation. I uh, apologize for interrupting you. What you're doing by allowing a proprietor to register, let's say, for cafe services, Rolls Royce Cafe, they probably do have cafes at their big uh, I don't know, but let's say uh, whatever. Services X. What you're doing by allowing them to register that is you are foregoing letting them forego the need to meet the requirements of ten three, which is reputation, link unfair advantage or detriment, for example, dilution, change of the economic behaviour. The, the, the law was thought quite carefully about these things. And certainly in this country, we didn't even really have anything beyond confusion at all. This has all come from the European directive. And it has come through gritted teeth to some extent. And it, it can only be deployed in the, in, in the most clear cases. In my submission. It is difficult, isn't it? Because you get from the CJEU decision, I think, but the mere fact that you don't intend to use something doesn't necessarily connote bad faith. But then it's quite difficult to see yes. within that category, beyond that, what the distinctive feature is. That yes, there's some things to be bad faith and other things not to be bad faith. Uh, I, it, it's very difficult to draw the line in a hypothetical case. I think we agree with that. You, you, if you can't draw it in a hypothetical case, it might be difficult to draw in a real case. 
Well, in this case, fortunately, we've got clear findings by the judge. Um, we've got clear findings by the judge. We've got evidence from Mr. Tazzy's own mouth what the strategy was. Um, we can see for ourselves. The facts speak for themselves. Uh, and we say it's very clear. But in another case, it might be that someone could... And we, you know, we were dealing with this at the ECJ when we were asked, do you or do you say that there has to be an intention to use? And we said, not really. It depends. Yes, possibly. Uh, I mean, our observations I can read out if you want. But we did. We said the answer to that question is negative. We do not require an intention to use. There may be an innocent lack of an intention to use. That's not the case here. So it's all in the mix. And I think the, the Monopoly case will show that well. You could apply, if you think about it, for a mark, the same goods five years later, innocently. How? Well, because you decided to let your old mark go. You've lost your priority date. It's a different mark. The vice is knowing what you're doing, reapplying with a fresh, young, evergreened mark, and keeping the old mark. So you have a seamless, perpetual protection. Right, so there's, there, there, everything can be done innocently or in a way that is within the statutory definition of bad faith. And that's, um, I think that, that's what we would say is the, the issue here. Um, I want to show you um, the, well, I, well, I think up, but th that essentially is the test now by two ECJ chambers. The Cotton case is at tab 32, paragraph 46. This is not some outlier or developing test. This is an established test now. And I wanted to just show you the Monopoly case, which you'll find in bundle to tab 42541. This is, uh, I don't know if uh, Hasbro have appealed this case to the Court of Justice. But it was a case that came from the Grand Board of Appeal, which is a sort of the enlarged version of the EU IPO Board of Appeal. And astonishingly, really, there was an oral hearing. There was cross-examination. They never ha yeah, have hearings there. It's always just done on the papers. Um, I don't know if my uh, friends ever participated in one. I've never even, uh, even asked. Well, once I've asked, I didn't get. Um, so the uh, position is that they don't do hearings. This was considered a, a very important case. It's now gone to the general court, uh, and I don't know if it's a, how many judges, one, two, looks like it's five judges, yes, it's the sixth chamber extended composition, so it's a beefed up general court, uh, one would expect that uh, there might well be, if Hasbro can uh, mount an appeal, uh, some reason for that to get past the new threshold for ECJ appeals, my lords may be aware that it's much more difficult now to appeal from the general court than it used to be. They've uh, erected a kind of permission requirement that's a bit similar to our own, maybe even more strict. Self-preservation. Self yes. <laughs> Inundated with appeals of, from the UIPO. So um, the position, uh, factual position was that the uh, Hasbro, the make makers of the Monopoly game, had, uh, without getting too bogged in down into the facts, reapplied uh, what is commonly called evergreen their evergreen, their part of their goods and services in a previous mark, and did so towards the end of the five-year grace period, not quite at the end. Um, and they hadn't copied out all of the goods and services, just some. I mean, I hope I'm not uh, misrepresenting the facts. It probably don't, I don't think much turns on the facts, because I wanted to really just talk about the, um, show, show my lords, the broader principles that come out of it. Um, and just picking it up at 32, uh, they talk about uh, the usual meaning being a dishonest state of mind or intention, but it must also be understood in the context of trademark law. Uh, and they cite uh, the paragraph that I was taking you to um, before. It must be understood in the context of trademark law, which is in the course of trade. Uh, and that's the context of it. Uh, the rules on the trademark were aimed at contributing to the understored competition and so on. Then we come to uh, the test, which is 33, application for registration of a mark, not with the aim of engaging fairly, but with the intention of undermining in a manner. And you'll see that, in fact, the motives professed by Monopoly were not, in a sense, dissimilar to the points that my lord 
Justice Floyd was putting to me, which is uh, they thought that they were uh, uh, that it would save them administration and cost and aid in the fight against counterfeiting, um, and that was essentially what they were arguing. Uh, but all of what the court has said here is about um, is, is it brings together a lot of the other case law that you've seen and the other cases. I'll just pick up 36, uh, sorry, th th 35. They talk about the Lint case and that being one fact pattern. And then they say at 36, that's just an example from a number of factors that are taken into account to decide bad faith. And they cite some other case law. And what they're really saying there is, and they say it over the page, the fact that any one of these factors is not present in the particular case at hand uh, doesn't prevent bad faith from applying. What they're saying is they're all intensely fact sensitive and, and you've got to just look at the, the position uh, before you. Uh, they talk, uh, I think, later on about the um, dishonest intention. I wanted to just show you this, which I think probably makes the clearest statement in answer to my learned friends it's a test of dishonesty. Paragraph 41, the concept of bad faith thus relates to a subjective motivation on the part of the trademark applicant, namely a dishonest intention or other sinister motive. It involves conduct which departs from accepted principles of ethical behaviour of honest commercial and business practices. And that's very similar to our Romax uh, domestic test that we've had for years. Um, and but it's interesting that they say dishonest intention or other sinister motive. They note that 42, that the trademark applicant is deemed to be presumed innocent, uh, 42, but that the burden can shift in 43. Once the objective circumstances relied upon by the applicant for a declaration of invalidity lead to the rebuttal of the presumption, it's really for the proprietor to provide plausible explanations regarding the objectives and commercial logic. Uh, and note 44, the proprietor is the one best place. Now, just to remind my lords what happened here, we got no documents and no witness. <laughs> Nothing. Now, I'm not talking about adverse inference. Imp we didn't have any account apart from Mr. Tansy. And that was damning enough, you could say. But it wasn't a case where somebody came forward and said, I genuinely thought I was entitled. I'm the person who designed this. Here's the document. We thought we were entitled to apply for all of these things. It would help us in a, a, a very expensive fight and so on. So even on the hypothesis that my Lord is putting to me, uh, even on the hypothesis that were in good faith, which we would question, uh, that wasn't this case. Then they say, um, th these are the, how can I put it, the straw man arguments that are erected by Hasbro that chime with those put forward by Sky. So 47, secondly, the applicant complains that the Board of Appeal found in effect that any refiling of a trademark automatically amounted to a filing of made in bad faith. It's like Mr. Hobbs saying, any broad term amounts in bad faith. That is not the case. It's nobody is suggesting that. You can refile innocently, and you can refile in a way that's done in bad faith, and likewise with broad terms and uh, class heading terms and long lists and so on. The key point is that you've got to show some connection with trade. Um, just wondering if there's anything else. Uh, yes, uh, this was the part 60. Uh, so picking it up at 58, it's necessary to point out the factors which led the Board of Appeal to find that the repeat filing was in bad faith. First, at 71, the Board of Appeal noted that the applicant relied on the contested mark and the earlier marks in the context of two sets of opposition proceedings. Just two. <laughs> We've got quite a few more than that, as I'll show you here. Um, it stated that decisions by which the applicant had been successful in those proceedings were based on the contested mark, uh, and it was not necessary to provide proof of use for those marks deployed in those proceedings. That applies here, but in spades. Uh, secondly, the factor was the Board of Appeal added, in essence, according to the testimony given at the oral hearing, 
by a person working for Hasbro, the applicant refiled for a number of reasons which might make its management of those marks easier in terms of administration. These were not identical repeat filings, some were broader and there were good commercial reasons for them. But the Board of Appeal found that since the earlier marks had not been surrendered, it was difficult on account of the additional work and increased investment to establish that there was an interest in such filings which was connected with the reduction of the administrative burden. So even if you consider that what you're doing is nothing wrong, uh, and you can see that in 61, uh, the testimony of the applicant was that not having to prove use was a benefit to the applicant. It was something that was considered by all brand owners, and it was not the sole motivator, and so on. And having marks of different ages was sensible, and so on. These factors are put forward in evidence in Hasbro and simply not regarded as being sufficient. They are regarded as essentially of admissions that there was no use or no intended use that was in accordance with the essential function of the marks. I mean, obviously the facts are different. It's in a, it, that particular case. Well, it's just quite easy to understand in this case, isn't it, what, what the undermining of the trademark system is because you're, you're avoiding adjudication by a court yes. uh, of... Uh, the right to have the mark revoked for non-use. Yep. It's an extreme um, case. It's an extreme well, case. Well, it's not an extreme case. It? It's, one which, it's, it's one which you can easily see that yes. it fits with what the Court of Justice is saying in paragraph 77 of the judgment in the present case. Yes. But um, I find it at the moment rather difficult to map those words in paragraph 77 on, onto broad claiming. Yes. They, they uh, are per se. It, it is a different vice. There's no doubt about that, and you have to uh, approach it at the right level of generality. The only reason I say that is because I'm now going to take you to the intention that we have here and to show you uh, what uh, happened in this case. And it's the evidence that Mr. Hobbs took you to yesterday um, rather quickly. Uh, and I wanted to show you what was simply what was said and the motivations that were given. Most of it was in the unchallenged witness statement extracted in the judgment, which starts off very um, unobjectionably and innocently, and then moves into a position where my submission gives the game away and forms the very basis of the judgment made against Scott. Um, that, coupled with the cross-examination, we say was rather clear. So if you pick up Mr... Oh, you can pick it up in the judgment... I think it's at uh, 250 and 251, the judgment. I was took it to you, took you to it yesterday. And I'd ask you to, to, to just take this quite slowly, if, if, if I can, if I can take it quite slowly, because it's the danger that the subtlety of it is lost. Um, it's just one reference there. You can pick it up, sorry, at 245, which is 222 of the bundle. Now, the way this was put, potentially by my learned friend yesterday, was, oh, Mr. Tansy was... There was a bit of knockabout fun on Mr. Tansy's Gladstone bags and bleaching preparations. OK, they didn't do those. But what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with what, with what they did do, which was apply for things which were a bit broad? That, that is not a correct characterization of what he said here. Now, he starts out, um, I do not recall, and these are in the judgment, I do not recall at any stage during the time when I was responsible for branding any discussion about applying for trademarks with the intention of blocking third parties. We know that's not required, so uh, we can just remove that yeah. paragraph. He says, in fact, the opposite was the case. Trademark protection was sought in order to protect Sky and one of our core assets, our brands. Well, a brand is one of those marketing things. It's not a trademark. A brand, in trademark terms, means what sign for what goods. So what he's saying is, we wanted to protect our, uh, our mark for, presumably, the things that we sell it for. And so he then says this, I was aware that a comprehensive list of goods and services was a feature of many of these applications that our housemark encompassed a diverse range of goods and services. 
However, there were sound commercial reasons for having broad trademark coverage, especially for our house mark, and to ensure that applications covered both actual use, the date of filing, and potential future use. So far, nothing wrong at all. That is exactly within the essential function of a mark. Uh, it doesn't have to have a settled intention to use. It doesn't have to have current use. And nobody's doubting that that's not a problem. He goes on to say, given it was not necessary to show current use as a prerequisite, there was no commercial sense in foregoing protection for prospective use of the Sky brand at the date of the trademark application. All of that is not the part that we rely on. I would make three further points, and it's these, in particular the first two, that I would draw my Lord's attention to, because these formed the basis, uh, coupled with the cross-examination of Mr. Tanzi, which the judge heard, uh, which my learned friend uh, has not taken me to, as far as I'm aware, and was during the relevant period, it is perfectly legitimate to apply for broad trademark protection. Now, this is not connected with use. Trademark officers, notably in the UK and EU, where there's no requirement to show actual use, accepted Sky's trademark application for such trademark specifications. I was aware from discussions with Mr. McLennan during the relevant period that it was normal and legitimate to include within a trademark application most, if not all, the goods or services in a particular class. Now, you look at any class on the trademarks register, and Sky could not have had uh, an objective commercial rationale to use them. So he's saying, I was told that it was normal and legitimate to include all, but most if not all, the goods or services, and we see that they did. So, and then he recognises that it would be wrong if it were wrong. <laughs> he would have stopped it. If at any stage I had learnt that filing for trademarks with broad specification, including all the general items in a class, was improper, I would have ensured that our practice changed and fell into line. So that's the first point, and we say really you can stop there because that explains everything. Second, as I recall, Sky's usual practice during the relevant period was to apply for both general descriptions, but for example, entertainment services, followed by a more granular list of subcategories in the context of entertainment services, video on demand. Now, if you think about that, what is the purpose of that? Now, he's not a lawyer, but the purpose of that can only be duplicative protection, security against one term being knocked out as opposed to the other, because entertainment service, um, what would you say, production of a TV program, that is an entertainment service. So when you apply for that, you must be taken to know that you are duplicating the protection. And we've seen that in spades in the sky marks, the things that express 10 ways when they only <clears> one. But that's what itself can't be wrong. Not itself. None of these things, my lord, are, are themselves wrong. I mean, it might um, be just thought quite prudent. If a <laughs> well, exactly. Judge but thinks if that there so were one term doesn't capture something you Absolutely. Sure. And, and, and that's entertainment, sir. <laughs> sky do entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to deny it. But, but it's like the, having subsidiary claims in a patent. Yes. It's not abusive. It's not abusive of itself. It is it, is it, is depends it a, what you apply. The judge rely on this as one of the consistent indicia of bad faith. No, but he did note at paragraph four, <coughs> he did remark upon this practice. Um, hmm. He says, uh, for reasons that appear in paragraph four, I must describe the specifications in a little more detail. And he talks about uh, how long they are and how they are increasingly detailed. And you've seen the... The, the, the enormously long specifications, but uh, as my lord says, those were not specific in this year. That's part of the context. And, and he says this, whilst this may have led to lengthy trademark specifications, I understand that it had the benefits of ensuring clarity for Sky and indeed for third parties as regards the scope of protections. Now, charity seems to have been uh, in his mind here, but I... Uh, that's what seems to be meant by clarity. It, we would say that this was no more than a way of populating the register so that it would come up and collide with any user of Sky, whether anywhere in the mark, Sky plus something, this Sky, that Sky, Sky, whatever, formative marks, uh, would collide them, collide against them on a 
a, a closer basis, taking account of the interdependence principle that I mentioned. But they'd have not only the similar goods, but they, as well as the similar marks and the reputation for the previous, you know, for the for the for the household name goods. Um, now, in the cross examination, it became quite clear. It, it, it's important not to salami slice these different terms. They were all part of one policy. So when you had a witness come to court and be cross-examined and come up with farcical ex post facto rationalizations for the use, you could see that there was no justification and there was no conception of the use at the time. And that is the critical point. It's not whether they intended to use chamois leather on the Sky-branded bicycle team and that that was fanciful because there was no Sky relationship at the date of application. It was that they were coming up with justifications after the fact because they didn't at the time turn their mind to the justifications. They populated the register with a policy, uh, out of a policy of applying broad and deep. And the judge cross-examined on some of these. I seem to recall the uh, insulation materials were uh, questions from the judge uh, and so on. But he were, these were all of a piece. He was cross-examined on the lot. And there was no basis for, and he couldn't say, because he didn't make the applications, there was no basis for suggesting that Sky had turned their mind to anything at the time. And what he did say suggested that they applied because they could get away with it and because it wasn't illegal so far as they knew and saw nothing wrong with their own behaviour. And that really is um, the first part of the uh, approach. And that <coughs> was proved, we say, by two further matters, the Section 32.3 signature to the UK IPO, which was a lie, under Section 32.3, you've got to declare a bona fide intention of use or, or uh, use or act intended use. And most importantly, it was proved by the uh, deployment of the 800 plus proceedings. 800. 800 proceedings based on these marks. I mean, this is not a few. This is not a bit aggressive. This is 800. I think it was 350 were brought in the EU um, in Ms. Campbell's first witness statement. And um, that was increased to, uh, she talks about 808 by the second witness statement, which was in July 2016. That, that the cutoff date was, sorry, let me get the dates right on this. <coughs> I should probably just show you it very quickly. The Sky Kick Bundle is Ms. Campbell's. Uh, Ms. Campbell's evidence. Yes. Um, uh, now she uh, is a solicitor employed by Sky. This was evidence put in by Sky. This was not. Uh, sorry. Oh, this oh, this sorry. Uh, Sky Kick Bundle. Uh, bundle Volume 1, Unagreed Documents, Tab 6 and Tab 15. Uh, you've got uh, Ms. Campbell was... Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, debate about other Sky marks and how which ones Sky have taken on and which ones they haven't. Um, but uh, she talks about... Um, a complete list, if you look at 19.3 on page 33, a complete list of Sky's UK and EU pending and registered marks is at Exhibit 1. Uh, further, I understand from Mishka Ray that inquiries of the EU IPO website by Skykick would have confirmed that Sky has been a very active and special, successful enforcer. So not only should you, little Skykick, know about all these little nooks and crannies of this mark, you should be logging onto the EU IPO website and you should understand that we've got a reputation for going after people. We've been a very active and successful enforcer of our rights 
And there was a list at EC2 of more than 530 positive decisions uh, up to 2016 against third parties attempting to use Sky, what, what became called Sky formative marks. You can see those uh, at page 34. Um, now, uh, 34, 34 uh, 35 of that same tab. You've got page after page of, I mean, just doing the best that I can. I think it's sort of uh, anything that starts with SKY is, take, is attacked. And we, we were attacked around this time anything it looks like in class nine but there are some very bizarre ones as well there were actions against balloon companies and uh, animal furs and skins fire extinguishers i'm trying to remember there were so many anyway sorry yeah 72 of the judgment of course uh, uh, highlights of some notable examples and, and these were so, so what's we say these do have a bearing because recall there were two limbs to the test. There's the specific third parties to prevent third parties. And then even without that purpose, using it for the purposes other than a trademark's function, their approach was to say, we should be able to have this and we should be able to uh, use these marks in any field, or sorry, stop others using this mark in any field um, for its own sake, irrespective of our use, and circumvent Section 10.3 extended provisions, and obviously circumvent the Section 10.2 provisions. I mean, it, it, it's hard to see why the mere fact that they brought lots of claims should cast doubt on their intentions. I mean, it, I agree entirely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> suppose they had brought numerous uh, proceedings, as they may well have done, in relation to core registrations. Absolutely. That would be entirely understandable. It would be entirely understandable, and uh, for example, many clothing brands operate in that space. But you know, this is Sky. You know, they're not. We don't have a million broadband providers all scurrying to use the word Sky. A bunch of pirates. You know, this is not. You know, Coca-Cola probably dealing with counterfeits a lot. Your Levi's jeans and your Nikes probably issue lots and lots of decisions. Fair, fair enough. That's not what's going on here. These are anybody who applies for the mark in the space is taken on. I mean, I don't know that there was never any real explanation as to how they uh, uh, go for some versus not others. But I, just doing the best I can to, to sort of describe the evidence in general terms, we put in evidence saying, well, what about all these large players? Sky Scanner, one of the biggest online flight bookers. You know, what, what about them? And they said, or oh, I can't remember what it was, but there was a Barney about you know who's been let go and who's been stopped and so on. The position is there are some major players out there, uh, and they have a, a rolling, uh, continuing to this day, enforcement activity against these people. That is not of itself a bad thing for the right in the right case. We say for this case, it is um, for the judge to have looked at this evidence, and he did note this. He, he came up with some of the more colourful examples in the round, and to evaluate as part of the facts uh, how they were. Uh, using these marks, and, and he, a trademark is a negative right, and it wasn't simply sat there on the register warning people, don't use, don't even think about counterfeiting sky, sky boxes or whatever it might be. This was, we're coming after you. I mean, in, in some broad sense, reasons. they must have been aiming to protect the brand. Of course, no, no, of course. It's a question of whether it's legitimate protection of the brand, yeah. and a, a fair competition, I think, as the uh, court put it. Um, I've got one last topic, which will be about five minutes, I hope, no longer. So, um, the last topic would be the uh, extent of validity. Uh, and on that, um, we have a fairly short submission and, and slightly longer submission. Um, the longer submission relates to the process by so, which the judge. Sorry, just before you go there, so you've moved off. Yes, on my roadmap, the last. Bad faith. You've moved on to extent, extent of validity, validity, which is part of it's part of validity. That's why I deal with it in that order. 
just before you do. Yes, of course. Um, so you take this to some evidence. Yes. Um, evidence which led the judge to say that Sky had no reasonable commercial rationale uh, and was uh, pursuing a strategy of seeking very broad protection regardless of whether it was commercially justified. Um, and that, that obviously fed through to the third judgment. Um, and I, I suppose an element of your case is, well, even supposing another judge might have reached a different conclusion, there was material from which the judge could arise yes. at that conclusion. Very much so. Very much so. <clears throat> and these are intensely fact-sensitive judgments to be made on bad faith against a difficult standard by the European Court. We say clear, but <laughs> equally, it's not, it doesn't trip off the tongue. It's not a familiar concept. It's an autonomous concept of EU law. Uh, and there's two limbs to it. And every one of these cases is different from the other one. Every single one. You will not find two cases alike. Cotton and this case identify the same test, but one is a case of a distributor, ex-distributor, who pinches his principal's mark, and then the other one is a completely different, you know, this case. Uh, and uh, they're all um, a matter of judgment. Mr. Tadsey, the key witness, was cross-examined on the evidence that the judge cites, um, and there was ample material, we say, although we didn't ask to uh, the judge to draw an adverse inference from the lack of the witnesses and the evidence and documents and so on, formally, the material wasn't there and the burden had passed by that point. It required, whatever you want to call it, in terms of burden, it called for an explanation. There was nothing coming from Sky. It was as it is now. There is nothing wrong with our behavior. And we say that there was a prima facie, more than prima facie, case, <coughs> a, ba a, a, ba a based case on, on, on this, and the, and the judge was well within the margins. Now, on was, was Mr. Tanzi cross examined about why Sky considered they uh, had a rationale for protecting computer software? There was, there was, uh, on computer software no. specifically, no. there was about no. the commercial rationale generally, there was. And that we said uh, covered the whole thing. I'll have to go back and have a look, but I don't think so. So there was nothing on computer Well, software. no doubt we'll double check that one if it sounds yeah. possible. Um, well, look, but, the answer is there was nothing on any of the selected goods yeah. and services at all. Well, if that turns out to be. <coughs> yeah. May, anyway, may well be. I don't recall. Manage, we're coming back tomorrow and you can come Yes, on. exactly. Exactly. Let, let, let me deal with that as a word. Um, can, can, can I just pursue that one moment more? Um, if, on the basis of the judge's view, Sky was pursuing this blanket approach, regardless of whether or not there was a particular commercial yeah. justification in the individual case. Uh, and uh, you would doubtless say that, aside from the selected goods and services, well, I imagine you say, there are other areas where uh, the, the whole mark must be bad. Oh, yes. Yep. Fine. Um, but you're not suggesting that every mark that Sky has ever applied for is tainted because they were pursuing this policy? No, we don't know because we were, these were the ones that were levelled against us. And then we launched a counterclaim against the whole mark or the goods and services in it. Of the ones that they selected, if one thinks about it for a moment, these were their best ones. These but were the ones they would have shown one, use. Best ones in the context of this case. Yes, exactly. But, but thinking more generally, yeah. if they are pursuing universally this yeah. policy, then presumably the policy could be said to apply not merely in relation to these particular yeah. marks or the, these particular uh, uh, registrations, yeah. but in relation to the absolutely core ones. These were one mark. Th these were core marks. Y yes. With different goods and services in them. And I'm so they're not a bunch of separate I'm marks. confusing myself. <laughs> they're quite, it's the same mark. But they, where they register the mark on yes. something that's absolutely core to their business, yes. it might still be said to be in pursuit of the general strategy. Yes. And possibly. you wouldn't then say that the mark was invalid. Well, I think we wouldn't say that the mark was invalid in relation to satellite broadcasting, no. Yes. Um, but they wouldn't have sued us on that. <laughs> no, but what, what, if the principle is yes. the general policy means that everything is tainted, yes. why isn't 
the registration in relation to satellite broadcasting teams? Well, we argued that now there was before the Court of Justice a general court judgment that Grupo Cellini that said you can't apply for a mark partly in good faith, partly in bad You've applied for it in bad faith. So if it's, it's tainted, it's uh, fraud, uh, it taints everything and so on. Um, we ran that argument. That was very unpopular with the court, as you can see. They didn't like that. The whole, uh, whole mark should not go. So the question then becomes, and this is really now, I guess we're getting into the extent of validity, what, how far do you go? How far do you go in relation to terms that were leveled against us? The judge took the view, had they, let's say we had been in the something to do with broadcasting, but not quite satellite broadcasting, then they would have sued us on satellite broadcasting. And it would have been difficult for us to have escaped that on grounds of bad faith. There's no doubt about that. But the question here was, the judge's approach was to cut them back to what he thought they had shown and probably reasonably could show. And, and I, I do follow that it yep. comes in at validity. I just wonder yep. whether it comes in at a prior stage, uh, whether there's a difficulty in saying that the mere fact that you have this blanket policy means that every registration has to be in bad faith. I mean, it's a, there are things they didn't turn their minds to. So of but, course they slavishly pulled the lever on the things that they had always applied for. That's the point. This was a policy that began, it seems, around this time. Certainly the deployment of these decisions, these attacks, and these particular marks all came in around the 2015-2016 phase when they matured into uh, cases that could be, marks that could be leveled against people. So it's not as if this has been going on forever. Um, we never had an explanation as to how it worked, frankly. It was Mr. McClellan wasn't called, and he was the, the man who knew. We don't know whether all of the marks were tainted by the same approach or whether all of these marks were tainted. I mean, it's quite difficult to understand what these marks cover just because of their sheer length as to what they cover. So when you have a mark like that, you uh, try and get them to narrow their case. Eventually they do, three weeks before trial. And then you've got these particular goods, and they look like they're either too wide or not what they do or whatever. Um, and so they're attacked on, on that basis and tainted on that basis, we say. I just worry that there must be some other element in it because if it were the case that wherever you would apply using this blanket policy, yes. you're applying in bad faith, that would seem to strike down things that you would were absolutely justified. Lord, in that was our argument on this on the Grupo yeah. Cellini point, because you had become, it was the application was one application, and you had chosen to put your crown jewel services and goods in there. That's your problem. And, and I followed that, and you lost. We, we lost. So that argument isn't available to you. So yeah. uh, one then has to think, well, if that isn't right, what What's is it that yeah. distinguishes the one registration from the other? What distinguishes it is that if the applicant has set out with not caring about applying for goods and services, then in principle, he should lose those terms. And that's my point on extent of validity. These terms should be struck out. But that could apply to And the it court. would if they were all relied upon, but they were withdrawn. That's the point. So the judge said, I'm going to give Sky seven days to withdraw all of these terms if they want. But, but the mere fact they've withdrawn them can't affect yeah, their yeah. vulnerability to an attack. So we just simply can't attack them. But if they were, they could actually rely on, as you've seen, many, many other terms in their Unless if they're all tainted by bad faith. Well, the, 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 the ones that they would level against us, yes. And why do we say that? Because those are the ones that were applied for without discrimination and then deployed purely as a legal weapon. So that, that, that's exactly right. Which I suppose comes back to this point, and I will shut up in one moment. The, you say those are the ones that were applied for without discrimination. Yes. Um, well, we've been told that there's a general policy. Yes. But, but that of itself doesn't seem to be enough. You have to look at the particular ones. And there, there might be a problem because the particular ones weren't being focused on. Well, I'm not sure. I. The middle part of what my lord said, which is that doesn't seem to be enough, we say that is enough. Well, it isn't enough to strike down 
registration in relation to satellite. Whatever. Oh, I see. Yes, to take the whole mark. Yeah. Yes, though no, that's not enough as a matter of law. But so it doesn't automatically go. If that's the case, then the, the court must carry the consequence that is just. I mean, it's got to be a proportionate response. If the court had reached a finding of bad faith, then the question would be, a party would be there, standing there in bad faith, on this hypothesis, having applied for all of those terms in bad faith pursuant to that policy, but the fact that it had an intention to use. You see, I think this may be the point. You can have an intention to use and still be acting in bad faith. That, that's just as you can be in good faith and have a lack of intention to use. It's a distraction intention to use. It's the motives and reasons why you apply in bad faith. And that is, uh, there has to be, we say, a consequence of the bad faith binding because the bad faith is in relation to those goods and services only, as the Court of Justice said. The question then is, what are those goods and services? I just, we say the Court has freedom of action on that. I'll just turn my red herring one moment longer. Um, I mean, if it isn't, if you can't say, well, there was a general policy, therefore every registration is bad, every registration was in bad faith. Every, every good or service, you mean, by all means, yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. You're, it's my I hope you get the gist of what I'm saying, even if the particulars are yes. wrong. Um, if you can't say that, uh, then are you excused from looking at the individual masses? So do you, is it not then incumbent on you to explore with a witness what the position was in relation to uh, whatever it is, um, computer services? Because I say that the questions that were asked of this witness went to all of the goods and services, all right? First of all, it, it's physically impossible to have asked the witness questions about these marks. I hope the lawyers would accept that from me. It would take you, I don't know how long, 8,000 terms. Um, so th th that's the first thing. Um, there was a certain amount of selectivity that had to go on. Um, the second point is that if your policy affects everything, then for us, everything was in play on bad faith blanket. It was all applied for in bad faith, whether they had applied for goods they intended to use or not, because there was no um, particular uh, approach of distinguishing. It was indiscriminate. Um, they can't make a virtue out of an indiscriminate approach by saying you didn't cross-examine on all the bits we didn't care about in the first place. So the reality is we we're not obliged to ask them, oh, did you intend to use for computer software? Or did you intend to use for computer services for whatever? That is not what we were required to do because the policy was to apply for that broad on the judge's findings. As far as we see it, um, that ship has now sailed. That they've, There's been a finding on that. The only question is the consequence. And we say, then, going back and taking a use-based approach or an intention to use, leaving aside the difficulties of proof, that my learned friends have never asked the court to do that. They want to keep their mark in full, even in circumstances of bad faith. Uh, and we say that must be unjust. They, you would have thought, would show contrition, come to the court, say, fine, we'll have a fallback specification and you still infringe. Here's what we did. Here's the meeting minute where we intended to use for this kind of software and that kind of so, uh, computer service and um, judge can we please have that fallback specification none of that it was all or nothing for them and we said our position was actually quite reasonable in my submission we said well the starting point should be these terms should go they're part of your plan which is to deploy these terms against all and sundry um, and uh, if that's not going to happen, then the judge should certainly not be restricting them back to a better uh, position than they would have even in a revocation case. So really, that's, um, that's our appeal on the extent of validity. Um, there was a point, it wasn't really a matter for adjudication by the judge. He was not asked. He says that he, he, um, he must do the best he can because we intended a fallback specification, but our primary submission was strike it out. It's infected. It's got to go. 
Sky are not prepared to even offer you any basis on which you can take a more uh, narrow position. Uh, as a secondary in our reply skeleton, we put in this fallback specification that you will have seen attached to our current spe uh, skeleton. But, uh, but uh, that was just critiqued by Sky, not met with their own version. So it's uh, difficult for us to see how the judge considered that it was right. I just wanted to show you the um, last really uh, point on this is the, the law, which is where the uh, ECJ deals with the extent of validity. So uh, we will pick that up at this moment. I just want to show you how the question comes in. It's behind tab 15 of your core bundle. I think this is my last reference before I sit down. Um, and you can see the questions in this case um, come in. There's quite a long uh, recitation of the, of the facts of the case, but if you pick it up at 310, can it be declared partly wholly valid on the IP translated? This is the computer software question. Um, I mean, it's on computer software, of course, my little friend is fastened on that in this case, but the purpose of that was only in the IP translator field. It was only examined in that context uh, of, its own, uh, of its own context. It says, then it says, uh, can it constitute bad faith to apply to register a trademark? Is it possible to conclude that the applicant made it partly in good faith, partly in bad, but no intention to use? In other words, is there a, a way that you can uh, distinguish between those? And so that's the fourth question. If we then look forward at that, there's, there's very little reasoning about uh, the extent of validity. But the sole paragraph is paragraph 80. In that regard, it's sufficient to note, as the Advocate General, that it follows clear, clearly from these provisions that where the ground of invalidity exists only in respect of some of the goods and services for which the mark is sought to be registered, the trademark is to be declared invalid as regards those goods and services only. Now, uh, the only point I would say about that is the words of the test do not say goods and services covered implicitly by the mark or the goods and services which the applicant can say it reasonably intended to use that are included within that term. No. The goods or services for which the mark is sought to be registered and it's to be declared invalid as regards those goods and services. Now that does tend to suggest that invalidity covers named, defined, expressed goods and services. Now, it's not free from difficulty. We wrote to Sky after the judgment and said it looks like it's going to have to be another reference because in those heady days when such things were possible, what do they mean by those goods and services? It wasn't clear. Um, they haven't made life easier. But we say if you were to look at things fairly and proportionately, for Sky to succeed in an infringement case that has been put in this shape-shifting way, email services surviving this is the sole infringement case, in unpleaded terms, for marks that were applied for overall in bad faith, that have been used to bully people uphill and down dale in this uh, in Europe and uh, here elsewhere would be unthinkable. These, are, these terms were in, as infected as the rest. You could decide that each of them should go because each of them was applied for in bad faith. They do not say in paragraph 80 that it's an intention to use that defines whether something stays or goes. They simply say invalidity as regards those goods and services only. We say at the very least these ones should go as infected terms, but my lords, even if you're happy with the judge's level of cutting back because you don't want to be too harsh on Sky. I don't know quite why others would take that approach, but uh, we say we don't infringe anyway, as I addressed you at the outset. It's the consequence of your argument on this aspect that um, 
uh, where the ground of invalidity does not exist. So, for example, the goods and services <coughs> have been are, are the very goods and services that have been used. Then um, uh, those those goods can be excised as well. No, well, it doesn't say use. It's just the ground of invalidity. The mm. ground of invalidity is bad faith. So, in fact, we. I mean, there's one, one, one way of reading this, the whole mark goes. You know, that, that, that's, look, we're trying to be reasonable <coughs> here. The judge has allowed Sky to take away its 98.9% of its marks, its terms, left us with these ones. We want, um, we think that those should go. They, they're tainted, bad faith, those terms. Mm. Well, let me just check. show a sensitivity to this issue, why have they never applied for revocation for non-use in this case? Why not? Judge says they could have. Judge said there was ample mechanism to do so. The answer, which is the only answer I can supply looking at it from over here, is that they know full well that if they applied for revocation for non-use, they would still end up infringing what we were left with. And therefore, an application for revocation for non-use would do them the slightest, not the slightest, of any good. So they want to go and achieve something at the front end by invoking the concept of bad faith and the concept of lack of clarity and precision, which has now gone away, except insofar as they want to bring it back again through the concept of bad faith, even though that wasn't the way the case went out to Luxembourg, or came back from Luxembourg, they want to actually go for the grand slam. It was the jackpot to begin with, to get rid of everything. The dirty dog gets no dinner here. You're bad people. You and your trademarks should all be obliterated. Well, that went nowhere. So we have the son of that argument. You're now looking at it, <clears throat> and you heard it just now. They want to knock out <coughs> the individual itemizations. It's a microcosmic version of the macrocosmic attack. It just says the same thing with a smaller footprint on the eight itemizations. A learned friend actually said to you a short while ago, no, I was cross-examining completely generally with Mr. Tanzi, and I couldn't possibly work my way through and he invokes the usual 8,200 words. I couldn't work my way through all of those. Quite right, he couldn't. So what should he have done? They knew full well, going into that trial, that the focus of attention 
the bit that was the problem for them was eight selected goods and services. And they absolutely refrained from cross-examining the witness on those eight. It's nothing to do with me, that decision, or my side, I should say, I wasn't at the trial. That's what they chose not to do. And that's in a case where no matter how much massaging you do on the words bad faith, you're going to end up with some concept which is um, linked to the vernacular expression, uh, the vernacular conception of bad faith, something bad and improper. It is, no matter how you fiddle around with the words, it is something in the nature of improper behaviour. Now, I listened carefully to what my learned friend was saying today. I always do, but I did today in particular. So, unless my notes are wrong, and I'll hear, and I'll see in the transcript if I've got it wrong, three times between ten past two this afternoon and me getting up now, I think it was three times, it was at least twice. It's not an absence of intent to use test. Thank you very much. That means that the whole of the case that was erected at trial that was the subject matter of question three of the order for reference must have gone on a false basis. Because if they'd said that to the judge at trial, it's not a, we're not saying it's an absence of, absence of intent to use case. We wouldn't have gone out and back with question three in the way it was. Then I heard this morning, you could have knocked me down with a feather. There's nothing wrong with the words. There's nothing wrong with the size of the list. And I thought to myself, that's SciTech. They've just agreed the SciTech point, which they did. Okay, so there's no bad faith in the size of the list of goods and services. Then I heard that my witness, Mr. Tansy, was an honest witness. Good enough for me. There's no adverse finding in the judgment and my opponent accepts he's an honest witness. That means you can take those paragraphs that were cited in the judgment for exactly what they say. And then... To cap it all off, there were, there were a couple of points, but I noted it down once in particular. They, meaning us, they didn't turn their minds to it. Whoa. This is a case of bad faith where intention is baked into the test for liability. He has to establish, a, a, I'm going to call it a wrong intention because the parameters of what makes it wrong are a matter for discussion. He has to establish a wrong intention. You don't establish a wrong intention by saying they didn't address their minds to it, they didn't turn their minds to this, that and the other. They were indifferent. That's not establishing an intention to any standard of intent, let alone the ones which come out of that test that we've got from the Court of Justice. And what my learned friend has done here, today, now, is to kick the struts out from under his own case at trial. And there was no other case. That was the case and he's absolutely kicked it to the ground here today. Proves if ever I needed any support for the proposition that before the judge could go off and begin to do the exercise of cutting at the specification, he should have required them to state what their case was and how it measured up to the ingredients that they were seeking to invoke out of the CJEU judgment. They didn't do it, and they cannot make a virtue of not doing it, and, no, and they've left the judge high and dry because he didn't do it either. This has turned into a thoroughly unjust procedure. It's because they keep changing their ground every time, opportunistically, some opportunity opens up, they dash in and move their position. I did insist on the architecture, and I call it the vocabulary, the architecture of the questions. I did insist that clarity and precision was the one that wrapped up and had within it 
all of the stuff about broad, overbroad claiming. And I did insist that their case on bad faith was linked to an absence of intention to use, hence question three in the order for reference. All right, well, they've tried to now bring it all back in and do it in circumstances where they're trying to make it measure up to a, a relevant and uh, proven intent of, of, of the bad kind. On what you have just heard here today from my learned friend, their case collapses. And it compounds the unfairness of the way in which the judge dealt with my client in the court below. Uh, you've heard, I'm, I'm just going to move off that because you, you'll see it in the transcript, you heard it, but I mean, what we hear when we're listening interactively and what we see in the transcript isn't always the same, but I am reasonably confident in my note-taking on the points that I've just made to your lordships. There was some kind of suggestion. I mean, he couldn't, my learned friend couldn't have been listening to me yesterday. I don't blame him. <laughs> that I hadn't addressed you on section 32.3. Well, I don't know how many times I mentioned Jaguar Land Rover. I don't know how many times I mentioned the point that you can't construe it as if the, um, the listings in the specification of goods and services are a catalogue. You can't construe the obligation under section 32.3 to mean you must put in a solemn declaration that you intend to use for any and all variables and so on subtended by the words, I, 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 you, know, well, you're, you know that I said it, I said it repeatedly, but I don't need to worry too much because he answered my Lord, Lord Justice Floyd, Sir Christopher Floyd this morning in terms. There's nothing wrong with filing, computer, filing for computer software, which is the paradigm we keep coming back to in this case. There's nothing wrong in filing for computer software as such. The words are not a problem. He accepted, at least I heard him accept, and if he didn't, he should have, that someone who does, in fact, deal in software, but may have a sort of niche product, can still describe it as computer software without telling, without telling a lie. That's the Jaguar Land Rover point. Of course, he accepted that. What did the judge mean when he said it was partly false, the declaration? He, he's, do you remember the, I, the exact number? I can't remember, but he said... He said it, they had three, there were three ways in which yes. they didn't intend to use. The judge was saying it was partly false, and I, I, my guess is that there were some with respect to which he was saying there was zero intention to use. Bleaching was the example. Bleaching keeps coming yeah. back. And then there were others where it was mixed, and, and the, all the goods and services of interest to us on this appeal are ones where the judge, the judge would say, but I don't respectfully, I respectfully disagree with him, where the judge would say it was mixed. In other words, you intended to use for some, and those immortal words, but not all. Well, was the judge saying that if you intended to use for some, but not all, for example, computer software, that was a partial lie? Yeah, I think you... I've lived with the judgment for some time. I've lived with other judgments of this kind. I've written judgments of this kind myself. I think he was. And I, that's why I opened up with the two blind spots, and I called this the second of the blind spots. And well, if I could refer to the judge, he might have been just referring to the, the first category there. Right? He, he might have been, but partly if, false there, but the rest true. He, he might have been, but but remember the context, my lord. We're into the third judgment, which is the judgment on liability. So he said it once in the main judgment, partly false. He says it again in the third judgment. There's only there's only <coughs> one context in which he could have been making that statement, yeah. and that's on the eight selected goods and services. Well, save only in the previous paragraph, as you pointed out in your opening submissions, uh, he addresses himself to Sky applying for the trademark. He did, but it's only relevant to say, and I found, and I'm taking it into account now, that there was a, false, a partly false statement. It would have no relevance to the price of eggs if the eggs in question weren't the eight selected goods and services. You, my lords will ask me, and I, uh, the judge isn't here, but I, I, would, I would answer, I, I believe that the judge would take the view that if you make a declaration under 32.3 for computer software at large, and you've only got an intention to use it for some sub-segments of it, 
I think the judge may take the view that that's a 32-3 violation. <coughs> And I respectfully disagree. Oh, t t I mean, just looking at the judgment some more, it's not apparent third? to me, that the, the third judgment, it's not apparent to me that that is what it's saying. No. Because you have 21 and 22, which possibly deal with the trademarks in the round. And then he moves on at 23 to say the next question is what should be done about the selected goods and services. Right. Then, then I can, then I'll, I'll, I'll just move forward on that basis. That's fine by me. Because what that means is that there can't be a Section 32.3 violation in relation to the eight selected goods and services because there was an intention to use within each of those categories the only conceivable basis on which there could be a false statement under 32.3 is if you adopt what I've described as the catalogue approach to the words. And if he didn't do it, he didn't do it, in which case, in which case he's, he's he would be wanting to say that I'm not a nice person and therefore um, I should be held in odium and contempt in other branches of my life. Well, I wonder, uh, I mean, I see the way you put it, which is that if he just meant bleach, that doesn't matter because we're not dealing with bleach. And if he meant anything more, he was wrong. That's the way you put it. I, I do. And I, that's like running through my stick of rock from the beginning to the end of my address to your logic. Yes. yes, but the way in which we were addressed by Mr. Melnick is was that these are all indicia, including the bleach, of a, a, an attitude by Sky that it really doesn't matter what you apply for, you can apply for anything under the sun. And that is therefore a strategy which could be characterized as bad faith in well, total. And so yeah. that in, in that way he seeks to bring in the bleach example is supporting the judge's finding of yeah. bad faith overall. Yeah, I, I think he does. Um, I think he does. And I also think he's completely wrong to even attempt to do it. Um, because um, where, where then will it end? I, I invoked my recollection of what the late Victorian Chancellor had said, that uh, equity doesn't require suitors to have led blameless lives. You'll have seen that probably in successive editions of Snell's Equity and so on. Um, Where's it going to end? So if he gets his way, there'll be a statement to that effect. Well, there is at the moment, unless and until the judge is reversed. There's a statement to that effect here. What does he do? He brings it out in the next trademark action. He brings it out in some other trademark registration. He says, we are outlaws. He's, he wants to turn us into outlaws. And he actually wants, he used twice this morning the concept of the punishment fitting the crime. This is the civil law. We do not turn people into outlaws. We measure the meets and bounds of their rights. We assess them to be enforceable or not, and we give appropriate relief, a measured and proportionate process. So if there is this suggestion that I, my clients have become outlaws because they have a general strategy, it's a comp my answer at the highest level is it's a completely wrong way of trying a case in the civil justice system in this country and probably any other, or in any other civilized nation. But let's not lose sight of the fact what Tansy said in those paragraphs that were read to you again just now correlates directly with the communication of the European Union Intellectual Property Office. That practice statement or communication, is it, it's 4 slash 03, Instead of me just referring it to, can I ask you to look at it? Can we, can we actually take five minutes on it? It's tab 60 in volume three of the authorities. Not that long. 16th of June, 2003. There is a procedure in the regulation for communications of this kind. And the, in other words, it has a certain um, legislative underpinning, the issuing of statements of this kind. So here's the communication concerning the use of class headings in lists of goods and services for community trademark applications and registration. Roman 1. Organisations representing community trademark applicants and proprietors and representatives 
have requested a clarification of the practice of the office regarding the use of class headings and the consequence of such use when community trademark applications and registrations are restricted or partially surrendered or are involved in opposition or cancellation proceedings. This communication is intended to explain and clarify the practice of the office. So that I met at times with what I said to you, it was only yesterday, um, that this is explaining and clarifying a practice is not making a new practice. Now, if you, if you wanted a little background on it, th this was a practice and procedure that some member states had already followed for themselves at the member state level on national registrations. And naturally, people from those member states thought and wanted and expected that they could use the same sort of approach in the EU, EU IPO. This communication statement says, yes, basically everybody can adopt this approach. Item Roman 3, towards the bottom of page 763. The office strongly recommends that applicants properly classify their list of goods and services in the application and group them in the order of the NIS classification. If this isn't done, the office will invite the applicant to remedy the deficiency pursuant to the rules, and this will lead to a delay. And then that paragraph at the bottom, it constitutes a proper specification of goods and services in a community trademark application if the general indications or the whole class heading provided for in the NIS classification are used. The use of these indications allows a proper classification and grouping. The office does not object to the use of any of the general indications of class headings as being too vague or indefinite contrary to the practice which is applied in some national offices in the European Union and in third countries in respect of some of the class headings and general indications. And then that next paragraph, so the first full paragraph on 764, it is further permitted to use a general indication mentioned in a class heading of a certain class and in addition more specific goods or services covered by the same general indication falling within the same class. For example, it is possible to indicate in Class 16 printed matter and also books, newspapers and magazines. That is what uh, Tansy was referring to, and it's what my learned friend was criticising in the sense that what's wrong, you can use the general wording, um, why do you have to go into all the molecular further concatenation of terms and expressions? The answer is, the EU IPO said it's perfectly okay to do it, and people did it. Item... Roman 4, the 34 classes for goods and the 11 classes for services comprise the totality of all goods and services. As a consequence of this, the use of all the general indications listed in the class headings of a particular class constitute a claim to all the goods or services falling within this particular class. Now this, received, this has been known by various forms of appellation, sometimes referred to as the coded listing. So you, you use the general headings, and by using it, this is why there was a reference in IP Translator, because they used the class headings, I forget which class it was, um, but because of this practice of saying that everything in the class is thereby subtended by the use of the subheading, you find that you've departed from words mean what they say, they become a coded reference to all the things that might be covered in that class, it's an abbreviated way of referring to everything. And that's what Tansy was talking about. Similarly, and here's a bit which really did cause trouble, similarly the use of a particular general indication found in the class heading, so it's only one of the general terms, will embrace all of the individual goods or services falling under that general indication and properly classified in the same class. For example, the use of the general indication pharmaceutical and veterinary preparations in class 5 will embrace all pharmaceutical preparations regardless of their composition or indication. Right, so this is piling coded message on top of coded message. Then, furthermore, where it may not be obvious under which of several general indications particular goods or services fall, there is nevertheless a classification-based reasoning for the proper classification. For example, computer software is classified in class 9 because of the presence of the general indication data processing equipment and computers in that class because computer software is seen as directly related to the 
corresponding apparatus or equipment. Therefore, when the specification contains data processing equipment and computers as a general indication, this will be considered as embracing also computer software. On the other hand, where a specification lists general indications in class 9 but not data processing equipment and computers, computer software will not be considered as falling within the specification. Now it happens to be the case that in, with the passage of time from 2003, computer software found its way up into the class headings and became a discrete item at the top of the pyramid, so to speak. Now, when you, see, when you see this practice, and it's a clarification of the existing practice, and then when you read Tansy's evidence up against it, this is why, this is what, this is why what happened did happen. So my learned friend says, never seen one longer than this, 8,200 and some odd X, Y, Z words, overcomes the challenge. Well, actually, there's one with 29,000 words in. But I don't want to turn this into a nuclear arms race on who's got the longest specification. The key point is simply this. It was the inevitable consequence of this practice statement from the president of the office that there would be long and ever longer and growing specifications. It was inevitable. And when you add in the further factor, which was there was a financial incentive. So for a period, and I believe from memory it covered the whole of this period, you could file for three classes using this methodology for the price of one. There was a financial incentive on applicants at the EU IPO to cover three classes for the price of one using this me methodology. It was too good to miss. And everybody of any size did it. And I would go so far as to say that if you were a trademark attorney or trademark professional at that time and you didn't do it, it might have been open to question whether you were delivering a, a, a professional service in accordance with the norms and practices within the sector in which you were working if you well, didn't do it. Well, I'm just a little, I'm, I'm, I hesitate to interrupt though, Fred, because of his long knowledge and experience of trademarks and so on, but this is bordering on giving evidence Court of Appeal on practice which is not established and we thoroughly challenge. Okay. The evidence that was in the case was that marks of this length, I mean marks of a thousand words or more are less than 1%. I don't know what he's talking about but if he's going to refer to facts he should really refer to the evidence. Well, well evidence all right. I'll treat myself as warned off of being informative and helpful in That's a general right. sense as to evidence. where we are. It's all right. <laughs> Fine. I'll stop. Can I just ask you, um, when that uh, communication refers to a general indication or the whole class heading, can you show me an example? That we, we've got some extracts from an East classification. Yes, we have. Um, there I'm is looking at page 697. Yes. If you give me a second to turn it up. Is there a chapter? Tab 56. Tab 56. Yes, let's do that. All right. So, what does the communication mean by a general indication found in the class heading? Okay. Turn to page, stamp page 697. Now, if you just keep a finger in 697, and you'll have picked up from the front page of the document on 691, <coughs> and it talks about the international classification, part one, with lists of goods and services in alphabetical order. So there are, there are two aspects to the NIS classification. The class headings, which change fairly regularly, and, that, and you're looking at class headings on 697. So in the eighth edition of the NIS classification, you've got the class headings, you've got goods, and then you've got the goods classes, that runs up to class 34, then you've got the services classes that run from 35 to 45. Those are the class headings. And the, the language of the trademark lawyers and the language of the Court of Justice in the IP translator case is to refer to these as the general indications. Beneath them, you have the things called the alphabetical list. The alphabetical list 
Uh, it won't be here. Is it here? Not yeah, here. It's on the We've got extracts. You've got extracts. Turn on. Turn on. Which 704. 704. Right. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, that's it. You can imagine how long that document is in, in, in real life. Um, so you've got an alphabetical list of goods and services, and you can tell you've got a cross-reference to the left-hand column down the vertical column to the, to the class to which the alphabetical listing belongs. Now, what that practice statement tells you is that if you use, pick any one you like, but um, I mean, oh, let's take the Lang Jaguar Land Rover one, class 12. As far as, yes, as far as I'm aware, class 12 hasn't changed since about, well, since the beginning, 1958 or 57. Vehicles apparatus for locomotion by land, air, or water. The EU IPO tells you that by using that language, you will be effectively protecting for everything which can be found within the alphabetical list if you did a reverse search uh, uh, for everything within class 12, you'd be covering it by using those general indications in the class heading. Now, the reason, I'm going to be accused of giving evidence again, but let me just try. The reason why you wouldn't necessarily want to just hold a general indication. You'd want it for all the benefits to you as a commercial operator that it brings. The reason why you wouldn't want to depend upon it is because you'd get the arguments about what it means on its true construction, and you'd get sort of interpretation to destruction on the theory about it only really in context covers a particular thing or two and doesn't reach me, the defendant, in what I'm doing. And so people, will, people would naturally, one would naturally want to use the general indications with a further concatenation of things from the alphabetical list, basically to head off basically arguments of the kind that we've been hearing here this morning. Now, for example, they, they, there's various examples, but class 15, Mr. Roberts has given me a note, class 15 is for musical instruments. Yes, musical instruments. It includes custom... Um, Conductors, batons, and things that you wouldn't regard. You would you get you get a pair of play a good tune on a on a conductor's baton. I don't think music but, stand. Music stand. But, but as I read the communication, if all you put in was musical instruments, you'd get everything. You've got the lot. But why would you also put violins and conductors, batons, and music stands? Well, what does it we, add? Well, it, it adds specificity. That's what Tansy was trying to say. It helps with clarity. It adds specificity. So you're not simply relying on the general words of musical instruments. You are making it clear in particular, going down the line, that you actually want to concentrate on this, that, maybe the other. Rather, it's a belt, I call it the belt and braces. It's a belt and braces approach. And that's because if you use broad words, you get broad arguments back against you as to what they do and they don't cover. But the problem with putting musical instruments and violins is someone is going to say, well, you've specified violins, so that's what you're really interested in. You're not really interested in drums. No, nobody says that. Nobody says that. <laughs> yes, they do. Thank well, <laughs> all right, OK. Um, I, the, the most recent case in England on this is Merck versus Merck which my Lord Lord Justice Floyd will remember, in which the Court of Appeal fully considered the questions of categories and subcategories. Now, for it, its standard practice, which class? It's class five. Pharmaceutical preparations. It's standard practice for everyone in the pharmaceutical industry to file for pharmaceutical preparations. They frequently don't even go for human use or veterinary use. They go for pharmaceutical preparations. And then there's a non-use attack, and it was fiercely contested in the Court of Appeal, and my Lord Lord Justice Floyd will remember, and there's a judgment which fully goes into the question of when you get to the end of the five-year period, you cut, cut down. How do you cut down? The answer is you cut down. The, the, the golden rule, the cardinal rule, is you cut down in a way which identifies preparation X for use in the treatment of ailment Y. It's generally regarded that in the application of the NIS classification and the listings that you find in it, that the main thing of interest 
for any good or service you're specifying is the purpose that it fulfills. And that, if my Lord has any questions for me more on this, I'm happy to deal with them now, but that I was about to say, and that leads me to a point about what do we mean by the core service? Or the core, actually, it's, you can say core about any of these things. What do we mean by the core? It rolls off the tongue. Avnet, ISO Act, it's also in read, read executive, read employment, which is in the bundle. It's been, it, it, it's commonly invoked. I recollect that my Lord Lord Justice Floyd, sitting at first instance, has periodically referred to this notion of identifying the core. Yes? True. But that states the problem and doesn't supply the answer. A rule of thumb I would invite you to consider as to what the core is, is what, are, what is the nature of the consumer need or, con need or requirement that is fulfilled by the defendant's thing you're looking at? What is the need, the consumer need or requirement that is fulfilled or met by it? And that, that fits with the notion of looking to see what the purpose of a given good is for the purposes of identifying a particular subcategory to which it belongs. Now, while I'm talking about the question of revocation and cancellation for part non, uh, for part cancellation for non-use, when you're cut down, and again, this is covered, this is covered very clearly and fully in Merck versus Merck in the Court of Appeal. When you're cut down, you're cut down to a category. That's really quite important when you bear in mind, to me anyway, when you bear in mind the second of my two blind spots. Even when you do the cutting down, you cut down to a category, you don't cut down to a catalogue. So whether you're looking at it at the top end going in when the first listing appears, or when you're looking at it coming out after the end of the five-year period, you're talking about categories, you're not talking about catalogues. What do you mean by category? Catalogue, okay. No, category. You Cat cut down to a category. Ah, right. Where, in, in terms of a niche classification, what are you cutting down to? All right, so let's take a familiar one. Class 25, 698. It's been forever under the niche classification clothing, footwear, headgear. And I'm hoping I don't receive emails from people watching this saying they've changed it within the last week or something. But since, as far, for as long as I can remember, Clothing, footwear, and headgear has been the general indications, the class headings for class 25. And you will find the register full of registrations in class 25 for those items at that level. If you get a non-use attack, you would be cut down. Now, I'm just trying to think. The case which did the cutting down was Meyer and Assos in the Court of Appeal. I'm very sorry, I can't remember whether my Lord or Justice Floyd was on the case, but Lord Justice Kitchen was on the case. That will tell you how the court approached the cutting down exercise in relation to clothing at large. So you would cut it down, and there's various uh, options or menus you might have. For example, you might have children's clothing, you might have underclothing, you might have hosiery, you, you might have... Um, outerwear, formal wear, rain wear. You can, I can go on, but you would identify a category, but you would never produce a complete catalogue of my, what might be within the subcategory you cut down to. And what's more, although the Court of Appeal in Meyer and Assos did cut down to something very specific, and you can see when you, if you look at the judgment that that was with a view to avoiding a conflict for infringement purposes, I think. Did it cause infringement or...? Releases. Well, it's on it, okay, um, but there are other cases. For example, there's the Animal case, which is Young versus Medici. There's uh, who was that? That was um, Mr. Jacob. Justice Jacob at first instance, and then there's Thomas Pink and Victoria's Secret. That was Mr. Justice Burse at first instance. And in both of those, did did they keep clothing in animal? Clo just clothing. Yeah. Just clothing. In both of those, there was a, a, a the the applicant no the registered proprietor was allowed to keep clothing at large. 
So even the process of cutting down is a very judgmental thing. Well, everything's judgmental in the court, of course, but it, it's a judgmental thing, and it doesn't necessarily follow that you will be cut to the bone. Now, cutting to the bone is the three-hold razor blades from Venezuela, which indeed is um, Mr. Thomas Blanco White, you see, very famously remarked, and it uh, wasn't forgotten by those who later became judges who'd heard him utter it. You can, you can end up with taking a view which requires you to describe with the utmost granularity the form of goods that the proprietor is allowed to retain. There's a lot of law on the subject, but the point I want to stress, if I may, is that um, even when you're cut down, you're cut down to a category, not a catalogue. And so the process of it, Hobbes's blind spot number two, I don't, I don't mean my blind spot, the, the second of the blind spots I identified, is <clears throat> the one that at no stage ever is it a catalogue. Now, I would invite you, um, those two blind spots, the second, the second of them, if your lordships were pleased to accept that I'm right on it, just about unravels this whole case. If you were to accept, a la Jaguar Land Rover, which I like, and uh, a la Cytec, and all of those other cases which we've cited, if you were to accept the proposition that I've described as the second blind spot from where I'm standing, I think it unravels the whole case. I didn't do anything wrong when I applied for computer software or any of those other things down the left-hand column. It's the, it's the central underpinning of what the judge did in his judgment in the court below. It's the central underpinning of it that I had use within those classes, within those categories. It's not a Section 32.3 violation, not a false statement. Can, can I just, yes. at the risk of confusing everybody again, no. um, just pursue it a moment longer. If we go back to paragraph 250 of the judge's main judgment. Yes. Would you give me a second to pull it up? Because I've got quite a few files open at the moment. Right. <clears throat> My lord, yes, I'm there. I mean, the judge finds, having referred to the evidence, having heard evidence, that you had no reasonable commercial rationale for seeking uh, registration. You pursued a strategy of seeking very broad protection of the trademarks, regardless of whether it was commercially justified. Now, at the moment, he's at the general level. He's talking in the generality. Yes, he is. Um, is it open to you to go behind that? I'm going to adopt the Maginot Line approach. I'm not going to wade through the tank traps. I'm going to go round the end of the Maginot Line or over the top, because it doesn't meet the case on the eight selected no, goods. I, I follow. So, so you're not challenging 250? I don't think I can, but I can justify it on the basis that it conforms to practice communication 4 slash 03. And then if we jump forward to paragraph 21 of the third judgment, oh, right. where one sees how the judge is feeding his thinking into the next stage. Um, just one second. Uh, paragraph 21, my lord. Paragraph 21. Yes, thank you. Thank you. He's still dealing with the trademarks in the round. Yes, at large. And we see that he says that you made the applications pursuant to a deliberate strategy of seeking very broad protection, regardless of whether it was commercially justified. Well, so, that's the question. But, but if you're not able to challenge 250, you can't challenge that either, can you? Just trying to see where... Did I... Okay. In respect of which... So 250 is in respect... Still at the trademark general level. But the specifications include goods and services in respect... So I'm in 250, in respect of which Sky had no reasonable commercial rationale. And my Lord is referring to the echo of that in 21. Yes, yes. in the middle. Right. That is my... The, so my answer is at the level of legal requirement. I don't have to have a commercial rationale at all. 
So even if I didn't, it takes the case nowhere. No, I follow. So, so you don't challenge, because you can't challenge, <coughs> the judges finding that you were pursuing a deliberate strategy of seeking very broad protection, regardless of whether it was commercially justified. It's, I'm, I'm squeezing it in all the time, but I suppose at face value, I'm stuck with it. Do you mind if I try to administer an <laughs> antidote for Bain? I did stress, I'm back to the main judgment, 252, I did stress that the judge himself said that it's unfinished, I, I paraphrase, it's unfinished business. He's made those general observations in 250, and, I, and, it, and it leads into 251 as well. But repeatedly, again and again, he's talking about some this and such as. So he's, he's never condescended to particularity in any of those paragraphs. Well, he does to some extent. And, and the only one that he cites for the second second category in 251 is computer software, telecommunications as well. 250, he doesn't condescend to particularity at all. 251, he, he gives a couple of examples. So we get bleaching preparations in his first category. In his second category, we get some of the uh, paradigm examples. He says computer software. And, and you know that I'm saying that computer software is not an example of anything nefarious in the slightest. So, so do bear with me on that. He gives those. Yeah. And then in the paragraph that I draw attention to in 252, he tells you, he tells the reader that it's unfinished business to actually go into and do the exercise of line drawing. And he's not going to draw any lines until the case comes back from Luxembourg and he's got the answer to the question. But is he not across the two judgments, and we can look at the particular passages, uh, treating the uh, application in relation to, say, computer software as an aspect of the general strategy? He is. And is he not entitled to do that? No, he's not, because it doesn't establish bad faith. That's perhaps a different question, but is he to entitled... Me, to me, my lord, that's no. the, to the question. Well, well, in that case, can I just break it down for a moment? Is it open to you to contest that the application in relation to computer software was an aspect of a deliberate strategy of seeking very broad protection regardless of whether it was commercially justified? It's the regardless of whether it's commercially justified that is actually sticking with me at the moment. It's... If you're talking about bleaching preparation, actually, actually, I think I'm asking out loud, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Is it the bleaching preparation? So, as I think, I think it was my Lord or Justice Nugent put to me, is it the bleaching preparations, which are the ones for which the judge is saying no commercial rationale? Or is he going further into the, the mixed ones Category two. I mean, if you look at, say, 24 of the third judgment, he obviously thinks that the deliberate strategy point applies to computer software. Yes, he does, but you know, you know from reading the judgment in its full context, the judge was adamant in his own mind that nobody should be able, for the reasons that Mr. Justice Laddie and the USPTO had said, nobody should be able to cover computer software in general, except in possibly very rare circumstances. So the judge, the judge had built into his analysis the proposition that computer software was too broad to be something relative to which you can have a commercial justification. My concern is, my, my concern, and this is, this is why the pivot point is where we are exchanging these observations between Bench and Barr. If you start with the view that someone has to have a commercial rationale, and then you look to the full possible enormity of what computer software might cover, you've already set yourself up to say that you treat computer software as a catalogue, and in relation to that catalogue, 
there isn't a commercial rationale for it. So I've, I'm reaching the point in these exchanges, for which I'm grateful, that to have the opportunity, I'm reaching the point that if you approach it from the wrong mindset, this is the sort of observation you will make between those paragraphs of 250 through 251 and into 252. Take them as a cluster because they are a group. If your mindset starts from the proposition that you, you shouldn't, there ought to be a law against it, it's illegal, immoral, and contagious. If you start with that mindset, you are bound to make the kind of observation here about there being no reasonable commercial rationale is, is where I would end up on this. So can I contest it? It depends on the viewpoint that you have. In other words, what are the criteria that inform the answer to the question? If I, if I switch to something which is an example I do use from time to time, if you're going to discuss similarity, which is in this case, just, just to use it as a way of trying to tease out my proposition here, I can make a statement that is equally true, that we're all, we're all very similar. Alternatively, I can make a statement which is equally true, that we're all very different. And they're both true, but the reason they're both true depends upon the criteria you're using for the purposes of answering the question. So we're all lawyers, yes. We're all trademark lawyers, or most of us are trademark lawyers. But then again, we're all different. Now, what, I'm, what I am cavilling at is the no reasonable commercial rationale in circumstances where the judge has already made it very, very clear that he regards computer software as something for which there can't be such. He would say that. So is it that insofar as the judge may have thought that the application as regards computer software was part of a deliberate strategy of seeking a very broad protection, regardless of whether it was commercially justified, I've forgotten where I began that sentence. No. But is it that um, uh, he wasn't entitled to take that view in relation to computer software, or is it that even supposing that he was right about that or was entitled to take that view, that wasn't enough of itself to establish bad faith? Certainly the latter, and I do, based on the exchanges I've just had between Benji and Bart, I take the former position as well. I do, it's not an either-or for me. I have both. The, the, well, at least I think I have both. The lordships will be the masters of my fate on that. Um, the, there's no escape. There is no escape from the, the judge's view about computer software. But there's, there's no doubt about it. From beginning to end, it runs through this like the lettering in a stick of rock. We end up where we do because of the starting point you choose, and that's not unusual. Where you start from usually often works out, often works out later down the line to where you end up. The judge wasn't going to have it. He was not going to have computer software as something that, can, that you can have a commercial rationale for in every conceivable version of it. I think what you want to say is that you can't challenge a statement that Sky had a strategy of seeking very broad protection of trademarks. But you say it was commercially justified in the sense that you're not claiming to have every species of computer software. You're simply saying what we do is computer software, and that's fine. Yes, I am saying that, and I need to go just a bit further, by the way, which is that the parameters within which the judge made that statement are parameters which I'm challenging. That's the procedural. No, 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 no. no. Right. Procedural. The procedural is beyond, beyond. It's beyond this. The parameters within which the judge made that statement are wrong parameters in point of law. Don't need a commercial justification. He thinks that you have to have a commercial justification from. A to N across the full breadth of computer software. He's wrong on that. So I attack the parameters within uh, which. It, when you say you attack the parameters, are you not rather attacking whether those things would amount to bad faith? Are they not? Sorry. 
I can deploy the argument on one side of the coin or the other. That which is not a relevant parameter going into that statement is no more a relevant statement, uh, no more a relevant parameter coming out of that statement for the purposes of a finding of bad faith according to the CJU judgment. I think I can have it both ways. If a judge doesn't direct himself correctly on what the legal requirement is, his assessment of whether it is or isn't met is vulnerable to reconsideration uh, and attack. He didn't direct himself correctly, he won't have given the correct answer. If within his own parameters he gave that answer, it still isn't sufficient to result in a finding of bad faith. You say there's a false premise built into, into his finding in the sentence that begins with moreover. Is this correct? May I ask which judgment you're in? So t 21 of uh, the third judgment. Yeah. It says that you say that sentence is founded on a false premise, namely that you have to have a commercial justification for everything which falls within... A, uh, a particular category. Remember the first of my blind spot. You don't have to have a commercial justification at all. Where did it come from? What, what, you, if you don't have to have an intention to use, now a conceded point, you don't have to identify all those things out of the CJU judgment. You don't have to know specifically or precisely or write them out shall I say categorically, where is it coming from that you have to have a commercial rationale? I can supply the answer. In circumstances where a case of bad faith is alleged, the absence of an intention to use and the absence of a commercial rationale can be treated as indicative or symptomatic of bad faith provided that you've got, an, uh, in the totality, things to put with it that make the case of bad faith. They can go towards a finding, but they cannot be themselves bad faith. There is no requirement for you to have a commercial rationale for your filing. It's because you get title by registration that the system operates that you stake your claim and those who wish to disturb your title come at you. They can come at you on the absolute grounds, they can come at you on the relative grounds, but you staked your claim and that's what they are up against. So in order to stake your claim, you do, you do not need to do more than comply with the formal requirements for a filing. But you also need to avoid bad faith and then you go into the CJU judgment to yes. see what that means. Yes. May I quibble? over the word avoid bad faith. You actually just file that you're vulnerable if you're guilty of bad faith. It's not so much avoiding it. There is a presumption of good faith and all of those other, consi other considerations. Uh, we've got 4.30. Is that going to be a convenient moment? Yes, or, uh, because apart from anything else, I want to read the transcript just to see that I have got, what, got correctly remembered what my learning father said. Uh, and just thinking ahead, um, how long do you think you will be tomorrow, or is that not yet possible to say? What do you think? I'm being told half a day from someone yes, wearing a mask on my left. Um, uh, Miss, Mr... Just, just to say what I'm going to ask Mr. Roberts to do. Um, my learned friend made, just as he did in his skeleton, and he, he, just as he did orally, no one would expect my clients to be offering this, that, and the other. My clients don't deliver this. My clients' products don't do that. It's in the name. It's cloud migration. There's no this, no that, no the other. Every one of those statements made in the skeleton on the other side, and every one of those oral statements is what we would call evidence Free. Mr. Robert's role is to assist your lordship with the evidence that isn't contained in the submissions that you've just been listening to. We think it must be over within half a day, mustn't it? There you go. So far. That's all we've got. 
when you say over and half day, do you mean your side? Yes, my side. Day? Yeah. My side. <laughs> and he's only got a narrow right of reply. That was what we haggled over with, with, when we did oh, the timetable. Uh, well, in that case, um, ten thirty in the morning. Thank you. Twenty seconds delay.